Welcome back, esteemed listeners, to another night of literary exploration on Midnight Pages. I'm Oliver Sterling, your guide through the enigmatic and profound seas of Herman Melville's Omoby Dick. Tonight, we delve into chapters 11, 12, and 13, where the narrative takes us through intimate moments and intriguing character studies. In chapter 11, Nightgown, we find our characters in the quiet hours of the night unveiling the subtleties of their personalities. Chapter 12, Iographical, offers a deeper understanding of Queequeg, enriching his character beyond mere appearances. Finally, Chapter 13, Wheelbarrow, takes us through the bustling streets of Nantucket, contrasting the stillness of the sea with the liveliness of land. Join me as we navigate these chapters, uncovering the layers of human experience. Melville has masterfully woven into his tale. Let's immerse ourselves in the world of Amoby Dick and discover the stories hidden within its pages. Chapter 11 Nightgown We had lain thus in bed, chatting and napping at short intervals, and Queequeg now and then affectionately throwing his brown tattooed legs over mine, and then drawing them back so entirely sociable and free and easy were we, when, at last, by reason of our confabulations, what little nappishness remained in us altogether departed, and we felt like getting up again, though daybreak was yet some way down the future. Yes, we became very wakeful, so much so that our recumbent position began to grow wearisome, and by little and little we found ourselves sitting up, the clothes well tucked around us, leaning against the headboard with our four knees drawn up close together, and our two noses bending over them, as if our knee pans were warming pans. We felt very nice and snug, the more so since it was so chilly out of doors, indeed out of bedclothes too, seeing that there was no fire in the room. The more so, I say, because truly to enjoy bodily warmth, some small part of you must be cold, for there is no quality in this world that is not what it is merely by contrast, nothing exists in itself. If you flatter yourself that you are all over comfortable, and have been so a long time, then you cannot be said to be comfortable any more. But if, like Queequeg and me in the bed, the tip of your nose or the crown of your head be slightly chilled, why then, indeed, in the general consciousness you feel most delightfully and unmistakably warm. For this reason a sleeping apartment should never be furnished with a fire, which is one of the luxurious discomforts of the rich. For the height of this sort of deliciousness is to have nothing but the blanket between you and your snugness and the cold of the outer air. Then there you lie like the one warm spark in the heart of an arctic crystal. We had been sitting in this crouching manner for some time, when all at once I thought I would open my eyes, for when between sheets, whether by day or by night, and whether asleep or awake, I have a way of always keeping my eyes shut, in order the more to concentrate the snugness of being in bed because no man can ever feel his own identity aright except his eyes be closed, as if darkness were indeed the proper element of our essences, though light be more congenial to our clay part. Upon opening my eyes then, and coming out of my own pleasant and self-created darkness into the imposed and coarse outer gloom of the unilluminated twelve o'clock at night, I experienced a disagreeable revulsion. Nor did I at all object to the hint from Queequeg that perhaps it were best to strike a light, seeing that we were so wide awake, and besides he felt a strong desire to have a few quiet puffs from his tomahawk. Be it said, that though I had felt such a strong repugnance to his smoking in the bed the night before, yet see how elastic our stiff prejudices grow when love once comes to bend them. For now I liked nothing better than to have Queequeg smoking by me, even in bed, because he seemed to be full of such serene household joy then. I no more felt unduly concerned for the landlord's policy of insurance. I was only alive to the condensed confidential comfortableness of sharing a pipe and a blanket with a real friend. With our shaggy jackets drawn about our shoulders, we now passed the tomahawk from one to the other, till slowly there grew, over us a blue hanging tester of smoke, illuminated by the flame of the new-lit lamp. Whether it was that this undulating tester rolled the savage away to far distant scenes, I know not but he now spoke of his native island, and, eager to hear his history, I begged him to go on and tell it. He gladly complied. 
Though at the time I but ill comprehended not a few of his words, yet subsequent disclosures, when I had become more familiar with his broken phraseology, now enable me to present the whole story such as it may prove in the mere skeleton I give. Chapter 12 Biographical Queequeg was a native of Rokavoko, an island far away to the west and south. It is not down in any map, true places never are. When a new hatched savage running wild about his native woodlands in a grass cloud, followed by the nibbling goats, as if he were a green sapling, even then, in Queequeg's ambitious soul, lurked a strong desire to see something more of Christendom than a specimen whaler or two. His father was a high chief, a king, his uncle a high priest, and on the maternal side he boasted ants who were the wives of unconquerable warriors. There was excellent blood in his veins, royal stuff, though sadly vitiated, I fear, by the cannibal propensity he nourished in his untutored youth. A Sag Harbor ship visited his father's bay, and Queequeg sought a passage to Christian lands. But the ship, having her full complement of seamen, spurned his suit, and not all the king his father's influence could prevail. But Queequeg vowed a vow. Alone in his canoe, he paddled off to a distant strait, which he knew the ship must pass through when she quitted the island. On one side was a coral reef, on the other a low tongue of land, covered with mangrove thickets that grew out into the water. Hiding his canoe, still afloat, among these thickets, with its prow seaward, he sat down in the stern, paddle low in hand, and when the ship was gliding by, like a flash he darted out, gained her side, with one backward. Dash of his foot capsized and sank his canoe, climbed up the chains, and throwing himself at full length upon the deck, grappled a ring bolt there, and swore not to let it go, though hacked in pieces. In vain the captain threatened to throw him overboard, suspended a cutlass over his naked wrists, Queequeg was the son of a king, and Queequeg budged not. Struck by his desperate dauntlessness, and his wild desire to visit Christendom, the captain at last relented, and told him he might make himself at home. But this fine young savage, this sea prince of Wales, never saw the captain's cabin. They put him down among the sailors, and made a whaleman of him. But like Tsar Peter content to toil in the shipyards of foreign cities, Queequeg disdained no seeming ignominy, if thereby he might happily gain the power of enlightening his untutored countrymen. For at bottom, so he told me, he was actuated by a profound desire to learn among the Christians, the arts whereby to make his people still happier than they were, and more than that, still better than they were. But, alas, the practices of whalemen soon convinced him that even Christians could be both miserable and wicked, infinitely more so, than all his father's heathens. Arrived at last in old Sag Harbor, and seeing what the sailors did there, and then going on to Nantucket, and seeing how they spent their wages in that place also, poor Queequeg gave it up for lost. Thought he, it's a wicked world in all meridians, I'll die a pagan. And thus an old idolater at heart, he yet lived among these Christians, wore their clothes, and tried to talk their gibberish. Hence the queer ways about him, though now some time from home. By hints, I asked him whether he did not propose going back, and having a coronation, since he might now consider his father dead and gone, he being very old and feeble at the last accounts. He answered no, not yet, and added that he was fearful Christianity, or rather Christians, had unfitted him for ascending the pure and undefiled throne of thirty pagan kings before him. But by and by, he said, he would return, as soon as he felt himself baptized again. For the nonce, however, he proposed to sail about, and sow his wild oats in all four oceans. They had made a harpooner of him, and that barbed iron was in lieu of a scepter now. I asked him what might be his immediate purpose, touching his future movements. He answered, to go to sea again, in his old vocation. Upon this, I told him that whaling was my own design, and informed him of my intention to sail out of Nantucket, as being the most promising port for an adventurous whaleman to embark from. He at once resolved to accompany me to that island, ship aboard the same vessel, get into the same watch, the same boat, the same mess with me, in short to share my every hap, with both my hands in his, boldly dip into the potluck of both worlds. To all this I joyously assented, 
for besides the affection I now felt for Queequeg, he was an experienced harpooner, and as such, could not fail to be of great usefulness to one, who, like me, was wholly ignorant of the mysteries of whaling, though well acquainted with the sea, as known to merchant seamen. His story being ended with his pipe's last dying puff, Queequeg embraced me, pressed his forehead against mine, and blowing out the light, we rolled over from each other, this way and that, and very soon were sleeping. Chapter 13 Wheelbarrow Next morning, Monday, after disposing of the embalmed head to a barber, for a block, I settled my own and comrade's bill, using, however, my comrade's money. The grinning landlord, as well as the boarders, seemed amazingly tickled at the sudden friendship which had sprung up between me and Queequeg, especially as Peter Coffin's cock and bull stories about him had previously so much alarmed me concerning the very person whom I now companied with. We borrowed a wheelbarrow, and embarking our things, including my own poor carpet bag, and Queequeg's canvas sack and hammock, away we went down to, the moss, the little Nantucket packet schooner moored at the wharf. As we were going along the people stared, not at Queequeg so much, for they were used to seeing cannibals like him in their streets, but at seeing him and me upon such confidential terms. But we heeded them not, going along wheeling the barrow by turns, and Queequeg now and then stopping to adjust the sheath on his harpoon barbs. I asked him why he carried such a troublesome thing with him ashore, and whether all whaling ships did not find their own harpoons. To this, in substance, he replied, that though what I hinted was true enough, yet he had a particular affection for his own harpoon, because it was of assured stuff, well tried in many a mortal combat, and deeply intimate with the hearts of whales. In short, like many inland reapers and mowers, who go into the farmer's meadows armed with their own scythes, though in no wise obliged to furnish them, even so, Queequeg, for his own private reasons, preferred his own harpoon. Shifting the barrow from my hand to his, he told me a funny story about the first wheelbarrow he had ever seen. It was in Sag Harbor. The owners of his ship, it seems, had lent him one, in which to carry his heavy chest to his boarding house. Not to seem ignorant about the thing, though in truth he was entirely so, concerning the precise way in which to manage the barrow, Queequeg puts his chest upon it, lashes it fast, and then shoulders the barrow and marches up the wharf. Why, said I, Queequeg, you might have known better than that, one would think. Didn't the people laugh? Upon this, he told me another story. The people of his island of Rokovoko, it seems, at their wedding feasts expressed the fragrant water of young coconuts into a large stained calabash like a punch bowl, and this punch bowl always forms the great central ornament on the braided mat where the feast is held. Now a certain grand merchant ship once touched at Rokovoko, and its commander, from all accounts, a very stately punctilious gentleman, at least for a sea captain, this commander was invited to the wedding feast of Queequeg's sister, a pretty young princess just turned of ten. Well, when all the wedding guests were assembled at the bride's bamboo cottage, this captain marches in, and being assigned the post of honor, placed himself over against the punch bowl, and between the high priest and his majesty the king, Queequeg's father. Grace being said, for those people have their grace as well as we, though Queequeg told me that unlike us, who at such times look downwards to our platters, they, on the contrary, copying the ducks, glance upwards to the great giver of all feasts, grace. I say, being said, the high priest opens the banquet by the immemorial ceremony of the island, that is, dipping his consecrated and consecrating fingers into the bowl before the blessed beverage circulates. Seeing himself placed next the priest, and noting the ceremony, and thinking himself, being captain of a ship, as having plain precedence over a mere island king, especially in the king's own house, the captain coolly proceeds to wash his hands in the punch bowl taking it I suppose for a huge finger glass. Now, said Queequeg, what you think now, didn't our people laugh? At last, passage paid, and luggage safe, we stood on board the schooner. Hoisting sail, it glided down the Akushnet River. On one side, New Bedford rose in terraces of streets, their ice-covered trees all glittering in the clear, cold air. Huge hills and mountains of casks on casks were piled upon her wharves, 
and side by side the world-wandering whale ships lay silent and safely moored at last, while from others came a sound of carpenters and coopers, with blended noises of fires and forges to melt the pitch, all betokening that new cruises were on the start. That one most perilous and long voyage ended, only begins a second, and a second ended, only begins a third, and so on, forever and for aye. Such is the endlessness, yeah, the intolerableness of all earthly effort. Gaining the more open water, the bracing breeze waxed fresh, the little moss tossed the quick foam from her bows, as a young colt his snortings. How I snuffed that tartar air, how I spurned that turnpike earth, that common highway all over dented with the marks of slavish heels and hoofs, and turned me to admire the magnanimity of the sea which will permit no records. At the same foam fountain, Queequeg seemed to drink and reel with me. His dusky nostrils swelled apart, he showed his filed and pointed teeth. On, on we flew, and our offing gained, the moss did homage to the blast, ducked and dived her bows as a slave before the sultan. Sideways leaning, we sideways darted, every rope yarn tingling like a wire, the two tall masts buckling like Indian canes in land tornadoes. So full of this reeling scene were we, as we stood by the plunging bowsprit, that for some time we did not notice the jeering glances of the passengers, a lubber-like assembly, who marveled that two fellow beings should be so companionable, as though a white man were anything more dignified than a whitewashed negro. But there were some boobies and bumpkins there, who, by their intense greenness, must have come from the heart and center of all verdure. Queequeg caught one of these young saplings mimicking him behind his back. I thought the bumpkin's hour of doom was come. Dropping his harpoon, the brawny savage caught him in his arms, and by an almost miraculous dexterity and strength, sent him high up bodily into the air. Then slightly tapping his stern in mid-somerset, the fellow landed with bursting lungs upon his feet, while Queequeg, turning his back upon him, lighted his tomahawk pipe and passed it to me for a puff. Captain! Captain! yelled the bumpkin, running towards that officer, Captain, Captain, here's the devil. Hello, you sir, cried the captain, a gaunt rib of the sea, stalking up to Queequeg, what in thunder do you mean by that? Don't you know you might have killed that chap? What him say, said Queequeg, as he mildly turned to me. He say, said I, that you came near kill e that man there, pointing to the still shivering greenhorn. Kill e cried Queequeg, twisting his tattooed face. Into an unearthly expression of disdain, ah. Him bevy small e fishy, Queequeg no kill e so small e fishy, Queequeg kill e big whale. Look you, roared the captain, I'll kill e you, you cannibal, if you try any more of your tricks aboard here, so mind your eye. But it so happened just then, that it was high time for the captain to mind his own eye. The prodigious strain upon the mainsail had parted the weather sheet, and the tremendous boom was now flying from side to side, completely sweeping the entire after part of the deck. The poor fellow whom Queequeg had handled so roughly, was swept overboard, all hands were in a panic, and to attempt snatching at the boom to stay it, seemed madness. It flew from right to left, and back again, almost in one ticking of a watch, and every instant seemed on the point of snapping into splinters. Nothing was done, and nothing seemed capable of being done, those on deck rushed towards the bows, and stood eyeing the boom as if it were the lower jaw of an exasperated whale. In the midst of this consternation, Queequeg dropped deftly to his knees, and crawling under the path of the boom, whipped hold of a rope, secured one end to the bulwarks, and then flinging the other like a lasso, caught it round the boom as it swept over his head, and at the next jerk, the spar was that way trapped, and all was safe. The schooner was run into the wind, and while the hands were clearing away the stern boat, Queequeg, stripped to the waist, darted from the side with a long living arc of a leap. For three minutes or more he was seen swimming like a dog, throwing his long arms straight out before him, and by turns revealing his brawny shoulders through the freezing foam. I looked at the grand and glorious fellow, but saw no one to be saved. The greenhorn had gone down. Shooting himself perpendicularly from the water, Queequeg, now took an instant's glance around him, and seeming to see just how matters were, dived down and disappeared. A few minutes more, 
and he rose again, one arm still striking out, and with the other dragging a lifeless form. The boat soon picked them up. The poor bumpkin was restored. All hands voted Queequeg a noble trump, the captain begged his pardon. From that hour I clove to Queequeg like a barnacle, yeah, till poor Queequeg took his last long dive. Was there ever such unconsciousness? He did not seem to think that he at all deserved a medal from the humane and magnanimous societies. He only asked for water, fresh water, something to wipe the brine off, that done, he put on dry clothes, lighted his pipe, and leaning against the bulwarks, and mildly eyeing those around him, seemed to be saying to himself, it's a mutual, joint stock world, in all meridians. We cannibals must help these Christians. Tonight's journey through chapters 11 to 13 of Herman Melville's Amoby Dick has brought us closer to the intricate fabric of life aboard the Pequod. In a nightgown, we glimpsed into the quieter, more introspective moments of our characters. Biographical gave us a deeper appreciation for Queequeg, revealing the rich tapestry of his past. And Wheelbarrow contrasted the serene sea with the bustling streets of Nantucket, showcasing Melville's skill in painting vivid setting. I hope these chapters have offered you a deeper understanding and enjoyment of Melville's masterpiece. Thank you for joining me, Oliver Sterling, on this literary expedition. As we close tonight's session on Midnight Pages, let the thoughts and themes we've uncovered linger in your mind, enriching your perspective of this timeless novel. Until next time, may your dreams be as boundless and profound as the ocean itself. Thank you.